Hello, everyone, and a very good afternoon. So today we are going to discuss a very important topic uh, that is about the energy crisis or energy problem in Pakistan. So we'll be discussing and exploring uh, different aspects of that uh, energy uh, crisis. So my name is Saqib Sharif. I am associate professor at IBA Karachi School of Business Studies. And with me is uh, Ammar Habib Khan. Uh, he's also assistant professor of practice at IBA Karachi. Besides his engagement with IBA, he's also uh, giving advice uh, and, uh, in industry. He's advisor to Ministry of Energy Power Division. Along with that, he's uh, expert in project finance, uh, investment banking, and private equity in the power and energy sector. So uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you, so uh, my first question uh, is, before we discuss the, uh, about the energy situation, uh, can you give an example of how an ordinary Pakistani is grappling with the high energy cost and prolonged load shedding? So there, there, there are two different questions here. High energy cost, cost and electricity cost in Pakistan is insanely high. Uh, for the most expensive units, it goes in the range of around 60 rupees, which is uh, about 20 cents, which is one of the highest in, in the world. In fact, it's more higher than most developed markets out there, 20 cents per unit or per KWH. So it is high. The mul multiple reasons of the, uh, why they're high, we'll go into that at a later stage. Load shedding? Load shedding is primarily a function of revenue-based load shedding. So what's really happening here is load shedding is largely happening in areas which have collection problems. Now, you're using electricity, but you're not paying your bills. Or there is a lot of electricity theft that's happening. That is why load shedding is happening. Pakistan currently has a surplus supply. And we have a demand problem. The actual demand deficit is more supply than demand. So it's not really a supply problem right now. But what's happening here is because a lot of people, significant number of households, do not pay their electricity bills, due to which they get load shedding. And because they don't pay their electricity bills, those bills, essentially, whatever is lost, is paid by the already paying customer. It's kind of a double whammy here. So it's more of a, let's say, governance and legal issue than, let's say, a typical demand supply issue. Okay, that's good. Uh, so, okay, we move to the next question. So, in Pakistan, we heard that uh, electricity generation, as you have also said, that the, there's no problem of uh, capacity. We have a surplus capacity in Pakistan. But can you give give us some statistics uh, or some data about total generation capacity vis-a-vis -vis the demand or peak demand? So, uh, demand, uh, I would say total capacity is in the range around 43,000 megawatts. It depends on what you really constitute demand because hydro in summer, you have a lot of hydro because rivers are flowing in there, but in winter, hydro stops. And our demand is uh, around, it maxes around 27 to 28,000 megawatts during peak summers. Like right now, it should be in the range of around in fact, uh, a few days, till the few days back, it was around 25,000 megawatts. And right now, maybe it should be around 27, 28,000 megawatts as the mercury starts increasing and the heat, it, it starts getting hotter. And so, yeah, so around 28,000 megawatts is the demand and 43,000 megawatts is the supply. But the problem is we have a lot of peak demand, that is summer demand. As winter approaches, as the cooling demand gets off the grid, we, our demand is in the range of around 10 to 12,000 megawatt. This means our industrial or core demand is very low, but we have a lot of peaking demand in place. So essentially we create this broad base infrastructure to cater to this peaking demand for, which lasts for essentially a few months. That is one of the bigger challenges out there because when you put on a power plant, it exists regardless of winter or summer, but your demand is only in summer. So there need to be multiple other ways to cater to this demand rather than just keep adding more and more capacity. Okay, that's good. So it's like almost double the... Mo mo more than double, more than actually, double. more than double. And uh, even right now, demand has, I would say, slightly lower during summer because electricity is too expensive. But the moment you, let's say, you reduce rate, you can see even 30 or 32,000 megawatt as well because the cooling demand is there and rightfully. So it's, it's just hot right now. So how we manage peaking demand, how we manage electricity when it it's not peaking, that is essentially a problem that you can solve with price more than anything else. Okay, that's very interesting. Okay, so uh, in the last one decade, there has been a huge investment in energy sector, especially in Pakistan. 
so uh, and the government uh, why so my question is why the government is allowing so much uh, investment or impl implementing excess capacity as you already mentioned that there's a the gap between the demand and the uh, capacity is high but still we see the government is uh, keep on investing in energy sector so 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 what happens here is when you decide that i want more power that takes at least 6 to 7 years to materialize you decide today you okay you know what i think there will be a shortage in the next 2 years and then you start building power plants it takes at least 5 to 7 years or in the case of uh, large dams even 10 to 15 years for that power to materialize so it's not like okay you've got shortage right now you flip a button and suddenly there is power so all of this is very long term planning but once that capacity is in place that just stays with you for 30 50 or even more years for example tarbela mangla these are big dam massive infrastructure projects that continue to serve their purpose in nuclear uh, the stated life capacity of nuclear is around 30 years but they can easily go up to 50 plus years so the problem with that is whenever you set a big power plant uh, its costs are front loaded so let's say you set up a, up a dam or hydroelectric power plant for uh, which can operate for the next 50 years but the full recovery of its costs will be in the first 10 years that is why a lot of capacity charge is front loaded now some people would say that you know what why isn't the cost recovery over the next 50 years because no one's going to give you debt for the next 50 years you when you set up a power plant you need two components in project finance or corporate finance you need debt and you need equity uh equity you can put on your own but debt there is certain limit of debt that you can get and that can be for 10 years 13 years 15 years pakistan isn't at that point where someone's going to give you debt for let's say 50 years so because you have to bear all of that cost in the first 10 years and the operations are 50 years that's why you feel a lot of pinch but once that cost is recovered then the cost of electricity generation significantly drops as well so again it's all about let's say having a view over the longer term rather than planning for the short term now if you just keep saying okay you know what let's just keep planning for the short term we can never have big infrastructure investments in place because anywhere in the world if you go for big infrastructure investments that has a very long lead time 5 years 7 years but when that is done they just stay in existence for more than 50 years ओके सो अमर साहब आपने शुरू में भी बताया कि वाई दे इज ए प्रॉब्लम ऑफ लोड शेडिंग लेकिन थोड़ा और ऑडियंस के लिए इफ यू कैन एलोब्रेट मोर क्योंकि आपने बात की कि दे इज अरप्लस इलेक्ट्रिसिटी बट वी हर्ड फ्राम लाइक अवर रिलेटिव इन इंटीरियर सिंस देर इज लोड शेडिंग ऑफ फ्राम अराउंड एट टू एटीन आवर्स पर डे सो वॉट्स द वॉट्स द रीजन people don't pay the electricity bills it's as simple as that so there are three dis four distribution companies that make up about 80 to 85% of all losses uh sepco i'll just take names with this public information at this point sepco hesco pesco and kesco that sakar hyderabad peshawar and quota uh, distribution companies and their losses are insane i mean since uh, a lot of the distribution companies some of them have losses greater than 50% in certain cases so this is why it's difficult to service those areas because if you are giving someone the electricity and they're not paying for this for every electron sent for every additional unit sent that is not being paid someone else has to pay for it that in, that is basically you and me or whoever the paying customer so it's more of a governance issue uh if people start paying their bills more importantly if the distribution companies make mechanisms that people start paying their bills or the legal framework is such that people are forced to pay their bills a lot of the problems will resolve themselves because someone somewhere has to pay for the unit that was sent out but no one paid for that and that is essentially the paying customer that is why the it keeps on multiplying one way that uh certain factions are essentially talking about it is that the right now what's happening again as i said earlier it's a governance issue so you've got distribution companies and they are federally mandated they're controlled by the federation uh at a federal level but at the, pro the so the provincial government does not really have an incentive or skin in the game to essentially push people to pay their bills or even subsidize the same such that they get uninterrupted electricity So what can be done here is that you've got the NFC award which is given to the provinces if we reallocate those provincial uh, federal subsidies to the province okay you know what everyone's going to get electricity but it's the province's responsibility either they can recover 
the bills or they can use the subsidy that they're getting from their budget budgetary allocations so and that is where the provincial skin in the game comes into play okay you know what do we take a loss here or we, do we actually improve law and order and overall legal enforcement such that uh, people start paying their bills so it is essentially a question about how pricing recoveries are devolved to the local level rather than just being controlled at a federal level okay that's interesting maybe uh there should be a awareness and a culture of paying uh, regularly or on so time. So the, the, <laughs> the, the culture is in certain yeah. areas, in, in a lot of areas in the country, why should we pay the bill? That, that is essentially the preconceived notion, we shouldn't be paying the bill. Yeah. So again, something's got to give there and that is where your provincial government and devolved forms of government, whether that's the union council or someone else, come into play, okay, okay, this area has more losses, let's work together and ensure that we reduce losses to zero and suddenly there will be no load shedding. The load shedding here is not a technical issue, it's more of a revenue issue. Because if we get, everyone gets uninterrupted electricity, those who are not paying their bills, their bills will be paid by people who are actually paying their bills, which actually means more increase in cost of electricity. So it's just a bad feedback loop mechanism. Uh, that would be very insightful. Okay, so talking about the power projects, uh, can you tell us like how uh, uh, they, are, they are being financed? What's the typical capital structure of uh, power projects? Uh, a typical capital structure of a power project is around 75% debt and 25% equity. Uh, the debt has a tenor of about 10 plus 3 years, where 3 is essentially the period under construction. The, and 10 is the period where the repayments start happening. So a lot of this debt earlier was essentially done in US dollar based debt. Why? Because a lot of machinery is essentially imported. So you need US dollar, but going forward, there may be plans where actually you can use PKR based debt as well. So you need a lot of capital because these are very intensive, capital intensive projects. A typical power plant will cost you anywhere between uh, 800 million to two to $3 billion. So you need that kind of capital and a lot of debt is used for that and that debt is essentially repaid over a period of let's say 10 years. Now who pays that debt? That the a component of that debt is essentially paid by you and me in our electricity bills. So when you look at your electricity bills, let's say, let's say it's 55 rupees a unit or 60 rupees a unit, about uh, I would say 20 rupees of that is essentially capacity payment. And within that 20 rupees, around 15 rupees, essentially debt payment. So in your 60 rupees, roughly 15 rupees per unit is just cost and servicing of debt. So that is how it is being serviced. And that is also a problem because the consumer did not really ask for a dollar based debt here. The sovereign actually took that decision, but the consumer is suffering now. So one way to work around it is essentially, and all of this debt is guaranteed by the sovereign, it has sovereign guarantee. So one of the ways that you can actually work around it, essentially this debt is moved to the sovereign and it actually becomes sovereign debt. So that the sovereign keeps on making its repayment rather than the consumer itself. This way suddenly you relieve the customer, the consumer of a significant portion of the electricity bill and suddenly electricity starts being more affordable again. Okay, that would be great. Okay, so uh, what about the tariff structure? Uh, how the tariff is structured for electricity generated from power plants? Uh, okay, so 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 uh, the tariff structure in Pakistan is a mix of variable and fixed components. The variable component is essentially the fuel cost. Let's say you are a power plant which generates electricity through coal. So whatever you generate in terms of KWH or electron, you need certain coal for that. But if you're not generating anything, you don't need coal. So that's a variable cost. Output is equal to input or whatever the proportionate input is. That's a variable cost. If you're generating at 80% capacity, you'll, your variable cost will change accordingly. But then there are certain fixed costs as well. Debt is a fixed cost. You have to repay debt whether you are generating anything or not. So that is a fixed cost component. You have to pay interest on that debt whether there is any generation or not, there needs to be a return on equity. You need to maintain that base level infrastructure for the power plant such that whenever you want to ramp up capacity, you can do that at whatever X hours of notice there is. So fixed cost and variable cost, these are the two main components of the tariff. And that's uh, actually the fixed cost, which is like putting more burden. Yeah, and that's actually, I'm just talking about the generation here. Now, if you move to consumer side, what the consumer is paying, so if you're paying, let's say 60 rupees, about 30 rupees of this, is roughly capacity and variable cost. Then you've got the transmission cost. Uh, from the power plant, 
gets to your distribution company. That's another, I would say, around four, uh, th three to four rupees. From the power plant to the, uh, sorry, from the distribution company to your house, that's another four to five rupees. So you're around 40 rupees is roughly the cost of electricity to get to your home. And then you've got taxes on it. You've got the sales side, which is around 18%. You've got a few taxes here and there as well. You've got electricity duty. So adding all of that up, you end up in the range of 55 to 60 rupees. So the electricity bill that you get at home, tariff you get at home, has multiple components. And each component is linked to the other component. So you've got to really break it down into smaller pieces and see what we can make more efficient, what we can resolve more such that overall electricity price goes down. Okay, then. Uh, okay, so when we talk about the uh, power purchase agreements, uh, how th uh, that has been a structure, especially if we talk about the like take or pay arrangement within the power purchasing agreement, can you? So uh, the, the thing there is Pakistan is an emerging economy and our risk is very high. The sovereign risk is very high. No one wants to invest in that country without having certain guarantees because as I said earlier, power, power plants are expensive projects. So a, a single project would cost you a billion dollars. If you're bringing in a billion dollars, investing a billion dollars, well, that's $200 million in equity or $800 million in debt. Whoever is providing that capital would want some certain assurances. No one's going to give you money and okay, so you know what, just take this money and just burn it or whatever. So what do you do about it? You give certain guarantees. You say, okay, okay you know what, even if there is no demand, I'm still going to ensure that your fixed cost is covered. That is what these take or pay agreements are about. If the country evolves to a certain point where our sovereign risk reduces, then we are in a position to create a market for power. In fact, we're already working on it right now, creating a market for power such that the government is not guaranteeing any demand. Um, I mean, maybe we're all students of economics here, and whenever you, the government or anyone starts guaranteeing something, that just leads to more distortion. So you have a certain base infrastructure in place. Now it's the time to really move towards market, and stop guaranteeing demand, stop providing guarantees, and slowly and steadily you can have a uh, private, um, public market develop for the same, rather than having a more cost plies distorted uh, tariff structure. Okay. If you talk about the post-COVID-19 scenario, uh, so uh, how the electricity generated or consumed uh, is squeezing both the government and the consumers of electricity, especially when we look at from the debt repayments in US currency, US dollars, and prevailing high interest rates uh, uh, across the globe? So uh, the, the last decade, I said between 2010 and 2021, uh, the US dollar interest rates were at their lowest point since forever. They were, they've been close to zero for the longest time. And a lot of these power plants were established in 2015, 16. And uh, at that point in time, interest rates were close to, let's say, 0.5, 0 0.7%. So it was cheap back then. Post COVID 19, when the global economy started tightening up, when uh, there was flight to quality, when uh, the Federal Reserve in the US started increasing interest rates, the interest rate on all our debt also started to increase. That started squeezing everyone as well. More importantly, because of the liquidity outflow, the PKR constantly depreciated as well. PKR has lost maybe about like 150% of its 100% of its value, I would say, over the last three to four years. That had a major impact. Why? Because a lot of our debt. It, well, a power sector debt was dollar based. So if PKR depreciates by 100%, essentially your dollar payments more than doubled in PKR. This was a major impact, depreciation and interest rate. Assuming surplus variables and the interest rates did not change, the currency did not depreciate, wouldn't be a problem. So uh, we ju we're just doing uh, an assessment with a friend and uh, in 2015, whatever tariffs were done, the tariffs were right now three times of that. and. I would say 90% of that can be explained by depreciation of the PKR and increased interest rates. So again, broader macroeconomics also play a role here. Again, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy or let's say a bad feedback loop where the as the currency depreciates, when you're just completely dependent on the imports and running the economy, when the dollar liquidity tightens, the currency depreciates and that just leads to inflation across the board. So this is essentially what's happening here as well. Yeah, that's, uh, I think it's very unfortunate, like it's actually killing the uh, consumers, especially the working class, middle class. So, uh, so this is what's happening because of PKR depreciation, you would see a lot of uh, inflation as well in the last three years. We've had like three years of 20% plus inflation. Growth has been uh, less than the, the population growth. Per capita income has actually stagnated or reducing. So a lot of people are actually being pushed into poverty and a lot of purchasing power is being lost. I just did an assessment over the last 
let's say five years since 2019 a lot of people have essentially lost 45 to 50 percent of their purchasing power mainly as a function of higher inflation which has largely driven by pkr depreciation okay so talking about the uh, uh, pandemic uh, do you think that this uh, russia ukraine war also uh, aggravated the situation further it, it, it did not it did to a certain extent but our inability to manage the same aggravated it further for example i'll give you an example here uh, when the war happened and oil prices increased instead of passing on the shock we someone had a brilliant idea that uh, we should subsidize petrol prices so we subsidized petrol prices so much that at one point in time a monthly fuel subsidy bill was around 90 billion rupees for six months that was around 500 to 600 billion rupees we subsidized an increasing cost in such a manner that the cost kept on increasing we essentially were subsidizing more utilization of fuel if you would have allowed the cost pressures to pass through suddenly you would have seen a drop in consumption people would change their lifestyle but you were like no let's just push it out and that just led to one thing after another and here we are so looking at the last five years, uh, can you uh, shed light on the demand uh, situation uh, for residential consumers and the industries and whether uh, this demand is actually benefiting the consumers and the industries or it's creating more problems? So uh, a lot of interesting things are happening here and that I would say this is how technology essentially disrupts everything. Post pandemic, there has been a surplus or overproduction of solar panels in China and that has led to uh, solar panel prices crashing across the world. Solar panel prices have decreased by around 50% in the last 18 months. So it's just very, very cheap to get solar panel right now. So you see a lot of domestic demand essentially moving off grid. A lot of industrial demand is moving off grid as well. So is a lot. So is a lot of domestic demand. Uh, you will see a lot of areas where there is high, very much load shedding. People are actually just switching to a single solar panel, a battery, and that just gives them enough power to figure out the day and you get some kind of electricity at night. So this feedback mechanism has led to a point where a lot of consumers are actually leaving the grid and uh, they're not completely off the grid because the battery price or electricity storage is very high right now. But if uh, battery prices start continue to follow the learning rate of solar solar panels, like at the rate at which solar prices kept on decreasing in price, it's only a matter of, let's say, four to five years, where battery prices will be cheap enough that it will be entirely possible for complete households to move off the grid and just use their own solar panel and their own batteries for the same. Okay. So moving towards the uh, affordable energy and economic growth, uh, can you... Uh, give the audience your take on that. There's a very strong relationship between electricity consumption and GDP growth. I would say it's a one-to-one -one relationship. 1.1 accents essentially. Uh, a one person increase in electricity consumption results in a 1.1 person increase in electricity growth. So to get that growth, you need electricity. You cannot grow without energy. I think that's something that's been settled for hundreds of years at this point. You need affordable energy to essentially grow. And you can have available energy but if it's not affordable if people can't buy it there won't be more consumption and there won't be more growth so to enable to catalyze GDP growth you need affordable energy you need to push businesses to actually start using energy to produce more and be more competitive so there's a very very strong relationship between the two so how this is impacting the businesses like uh, uh, business consumption has dropped about uh, I would say 20 percent since its peak in 2021 and uh, due to increase in prices, that has been a problem. But I would say uh, one thing as well, if you look at the elasticity, elasticity does, it's not that significant because electricity consumes fairly inelastic. A lot of businesses are able to pass on prices. So essentially as electricity price increases, the product price increases as well. So you see the whole inflation transmission mechanism uh, happening as well. The problem really comes in the case of export because in exports you are operating in a very competitive environment and the cost of each input matters more than anything else. Because other electricity prices are so high, we are not competitive in a lot of goods. For example, in the case of let's say steel or in the case of aluminum, we cannot do a lot of heavy processing uh, stuff here. Uh, mainly because to be competitive in making steel, your electricity rates need to be in the range of around let's say 3 to 4 cents per unit. We are at 20 cents per unit for aluminium is the same. So we need to restructure how we think about electricity, how we think about energy in order to essentially move towards industrialization. At 20 cents per unit, you cannot simply industrialize.
Okay, Marsa, you have talked about the uh, prices of the solar panels has been uh, drastically reduced and people are just uh, uh, implementing on their rooftops. So uh, what is this concept of duck curve? Yeah. So in a lot of markets, I've seen a uh, rich return increase. It's happening first because their affordability was high. Now the solar panel prices are reducing. Uh, you are seeing more emerging markets or poorer economies adopt that as well. So. The concept of duck curve is the solar, uh, the power demand curve essentially follows a duck where during peak summer hours or where during peak hours of let's say the sunlight is there, the demand from the grid is very low because solar is being utilized for electricity generation. But as the sun goes down, the demand from the grid starts slowly going up. So a lot of countries are look for, uh, have planned or prepared for the duck curve and the duck curve is already here. In a lot of US states, the duck curve is there, Europe, Turkey, a lot of these places. In Pakistan, we're seeing that emerge slowly as well. And that is why we need to prepare for a proper duck curve because solar adoption can't really fight technology. The te technology will prevail. It's about how we manage our grid, how we manage our circumstances, just to ensure we are ready to basically align with whatever technology throws at us. Okay, so talking about the energy transition, so how you see it in future, uh, whether the, the government of Pakistan is actually going towards low carbon uh, energy solutions? So Pakistan uh, in, uh, by design or incidentally has one of the better energy mixes in the entire world. 55% of our energy is just low carbon, which is hydro and nuclear. And a lot of solar is coming up as well. So going forward, I see a lot of new solar coming up, a lot of new hydro coming up. Our uh, energy mix would be 70% renewable uh, very easily. And uh, we will have a lot of distributed or let's say community grids as well, where a lot of people would have solar, they were storage solutions, and then they're essentially going to be using more of the in-house in -house generated uh, electricity than buying from the grid. So the grid essentially needs to evolve to really with the, uh, evolve with the technology rather than just pretending that it's going to have a monopoly forever. Okay, no, that's uh, very insightful. So uh, let's talk about the solution. I'll make it the last question. So what are the uh, some of the flaws in the existing market structure? whereby Pakistan is a single buyer, as we know, uh, from multiple power generation firms. So what changes are needed uh, to make it more competitive? So Pakistan has a single buyer model, which uh, obviously see for any commodity in the world, for anywhere, single buyer model is probably the worst thing anyone can do to a market, because you essentially take out all possibilities for any efficiency gains. What we need here is to move from a single buyer model to multi-buyer, multi-seller model, where anyone can buy and anyone can sell electricity. You start with bigger units first, bigger consumers first, slowly and steadily move towards, let's say, smaller consumers, which is essentially your households who are generating electricity from solar. That is how you move to a market. We need to create a market for this. There are a lot of stranded costs, a lot of power plants are there, someone's got to pay that cost. That needs to be structured. A lot of financial structuring is required, such that sovereign debt is actually moved to the sovereign rather than being parked in private balance sheets. So that needs to be structured. But the ultimate objective needs to be a transition towards a more market-oriented price rather than a very brute metric of a single price across the country. Because we need, I mean, the classic co concept of competitive advantage, a competitive advantage. And let's say Thar, Thar has, uh, you can generate electricity at Thar in at around like three or four rupees per unit, which is essentially less than two cents. So why can't we have more industry at Thar where it has a competitive advantage in electricity? Or why can't we do uh, something in KP which has a competitive advantage in electricity? So we need to reallocate resources in a way which align with competitive advantages rather than just having a one brute force number that may work for some but does not work for anyone else. Okay, that, that's very insightful. Thank you very much for your... Uh, Thank you, Dr. Sagar. It's uh, very uh, interesting, and I hope uh, through this discussion, uh, the audience have learned a lot about uh, what needs to be done and why uh, the problems which we have discussed is actually killing not only the government, squeezing the exchequer, but also the uh, putting too much pressure or burden on the consumers. That's right. Thank you, Mervish. Thank you, Dr. Sagar. Thank you.